Hi guys, and welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. Today, guys, today I will be discussing Boosh Valor, book two of The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn. So guys, if you have seen my discussion with the Professor Philip Chase, Abby, Patrick, and Alex, uh, you know kind of my feelings or all of our feelings about this, but I wanted to go maybe a little bit more in depth and non-spoilery if you haven't read it yet. And if you have not seen that, it was it is right here. Please go check that out. It was so, so fun. And next month, uh, or this month, no, next month, uh, our Ruin discussion will be on Abby's channel. So if you're not subscribed to all of those people, subscribe to them and then go check this out and then watch our Ruin discussion in March. So, this book is so good. Like, this is... The story that Gwen is telling is is really it's just exciting and fun and 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 just it's about truth and courage and it's just about good versus evil and you know what sometimes sometimes I want that sometimes I don't need like amoral or you know ugh, anti heroes like standing around looking mysterious and brooding and and you know having to oh what kind of like line will I have to cross to get this oh the hard boiled detective is he gonna be what is he have to, gonna have to do like just give me a good guy and a bad guy sometimes just make it simple and Gwyn in large parts does there are characters in this book that are very clearly good, characters that are very, very clearly evil. I'm looking at freaking you, freaking Jael, and freaking Lycos. And that is not a spoiler because if you've read the first book, you definitely know that they are both douchebags. So this book starts right after Malice. Like, it just feels like a continuation of that first book because it starts minutes after Malice takes place and it just hits the ground running and it does not stop. Like, it was exhausting at times because it was just go, 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 go. Fully, like, half the book is, like, fleeing. They are fleeing for a long... And they, you flee. Oh, gotta fight. Oh, flee. Oh, fight. Flee. Oh, guys... There is so much battle in this. This series is not for you if you do not like fighting in books. If you do not like battle scenes, you, you have no business reading these books because there's so much fighting and I love that and it's really well written. And despite the fact they're so bleeding many of them, it never feels like I'm never tired of seeing it. It doesn't feel boring. It, they're always fought in different ways and they're all, every fight serves a purpose. Something comes from each of the fights, which I love. This is something that R.A. Salvatore does not do as well. If you've ever read any Salvatore books, Salvatore has fights just to have fights, just to show off like how amazing the fight choreography is, which is cool, but I cannot tell you how many freaking roving bands of goblins that Dritz and his crew had to kill, or oh, in The Demon Awakens, how many, like, what are they? Gob are there goblins in that and powerings? Yeah, goblins. Are like, how many times do I need to see that? Ugh. Like, I know El Brian can fight. Like, we get it. So the fighting never really gets old, but it does get tiring because you just don't even get, get, get a chance to catch your breath. But there are these quiet moments that uh, we talked about in our in our, our chat there that after the fight, that's when you can catch your breath and that's when you see people react to what happened in the fight. And those moments are just so good and it just... It just tells us so much about the characters, how they respond to what happened. And Gwyn's just created something really special with this story. And it, and it ends. It, it doesn't stop till the end. And even the end gives you a barely a breather. Like maybe we'll have just a second to breathe before book three begins. I don't know. I'm starting it this month and I am super excited. So in my Malice video, I insisted that this was Vikings. Because Vikings is my catch-all for like all northern people. Like Celts and Anglo-Saxons and like Vikings, Norsemen. All of that is catch-all with Vikings. But I'll walk that back a little bit, uh, just to be more specific. I, while reading this book, there's a major river called the Rhenus, which is Latin for the Rhine. And so at that point, like, I was like, oh, like, is this Gaul? And then Philip told me that, that Gwyn had kind of admitted that this was partially based on Caesar's Gallic Wars. And at that, not only did just I love it even more after that, it just took on a new level for me. So now I see these guys as the Gauls, the Helvetii, and the, the Belgae, and the Celts. Uh, the Celts in their language, the Gauls in ours, as Caesar wrote. And so, like, 
I see their fighting style of like man to man and, and just like everyone charges and you find you find you kill this guy and then when he's dead you find another guy to kill versus the shield wall, the impenetrable shield wall of the Romans, which is, you know, Veritas and his shield wall from Tenebral. <laughs> Veritas, I mean... He's so Roman, he doesn't even wear pants because pants were for barbarians, according to the Romans. Like the Gauls wore pants, the Romans did not. And so in these leaders of the banished lands, I start to, I started to see like Ambiorix and Orgetorix and Vercingetorix and all these, and Alaric and all these other like Gallic leaders from Caesar's Gallic War. Hi guys, Editing Alan here. And so normally I would just like put a text thing up to correct it, but it is very important that uh, I correct some of the information that I just said in this video. Uh, I said uh, Alaric um, as one of the Gallic leaders. I just misspoke. Alaric was uh, the king of the Goths that ended up sacking Rome in like the 300s. Uh, I meant to say Ariovistus, uh, who was in Caesar's Gallic War Book One, um, the leader of the Gauls. So I thought it was very important. So like all you, all you Roman and Gallic scholars out there, don't comment like, well, actually, Alan. It was Ariovistus and not Alaric that was in the Gallic War. Alaric sacked Rome. So just to avoid that, because I know there's a bunch of you out there, um, I needed to make a correction. So I meant Ariovistus, not Alaric. It's just so freaking cool that that it was even a consideration when making this. Now the characters in Valor, they, they're, I mean, it's just, he just builds off the character work that he did in Malice. We get a couple new perspective chapters, which are freaking, they're, they're good. Like all the new POV chapters are, are just really, really good. But I do need to warn you, do not read the Goodreads synopsis of this book. Like my copy, the UK copy has like a, has a synopsis on the back. The American one does not. It just has like praise for Malice. So I went on Goodreads to read, you know, the what should be the blurb on the back. It gives something away that doesn't even have it on page 300. So the whole time I'm like, oh, I guess I thought it was going to happen at the beginning because of what Goodreads said. No, that was on page 300. So I knew it was coming, which is super annoying. But I mean, it's not a huge deal, but it is really cool. And I think it does spoil it a little bit. So don't read Goodreads. Just... Don't ever read Goodreads thing. They spoil, they, they did it all the freaking time. Like they did it for Price of Spring too. It's just, stop, don't, Goodreads. Just, just post what's on the back. Stop giving some away. But these characters, like including the new ones are just really, really good. Like they're, he takes these archetypes, Gwyn does, and he changes our expectation or smooths them out to make them less kind of cardboard cutouts and more like fleshy. He bakes them in, the, in his kiln of, of realism and three, and three dimensions. And so Corbin, I don't like the chosen farm boy ever. Like I don't ever like it, but Corbin is so, he is so annoying for just sulking in the fact that he doesn't want to be the chosen one. He doesn't want to be the chosen one. Like, he, like he's like, I don't want to do it. No. No! So he's just annoying, but also so realistic as just this lost kid. He's 16, and he's just seen everything he knows just die. He's lost, he's lost everything. Like, he lost his home, lost his sister, lost his dad. He's lost all, ev almost everything he knows. I wish I could say this was the first time that this has happened to me today and freaking his mom and gar want to take him off and go be the chosen one and take him away from the the remnant remnant of home and his friends that he has and so i completely get it and his just guileless loyalty and kind-heartedness is just so endearing that he really just he, uh, by the end i was like corbin that's my boy right there like i was 100 percent behind this chosen one farm boy he just, Gwyn just wrote, writes these young characters really well. I normally don't like reading about young characters. I find them insufferable. Um, mostly because I teach, I teach public school. And so, ugh, I mean, I love my students, but man. But Gwyn has done, has, has just, I don't know. He's just made them super endearing to me. And that was the way, uh, through, that was throughout the whole, throughout the whole book. I just really, I found myself being attached to these younger characters where normally I would just be like, can we, can I, can I visit the adults please? And with that being said, with things that I normally don't enjoy that I liked in this one, and this shocked Abby for sure, I actually really liked the cute romances that are budding between a couple of the characters in this book. I can't really give it away, but there are two romances that they don't really take center stage. They just kind of happen on the fringes. And it's just these, these 
young, these young people, like, and even there's a couple, there's a, uh, like one that's even with the adults, but it's just like, it was just sweet and it's hard to hate because again, there's no like, I don't know. It just is really feel good. And I like when there are things that are just unladen with like just deception and just games and all this stuff. And it just felt very fresh to just see just laid out these people just like kind of falling for each other. And I really like that as well as like, I did not like the crow crap in the first one because all he does is sit in Brina's house and go Rah! and say dumb crap. But him combined with the raven in this one, I really like the animal companions in this as well. So I don't know what's happening to me. Maybe I'm changing. Maybe I'm a new person. I have no idea, but I really, really like the way he wrote the animal companions in this book as well. Uh, another character that bears mention, like besides Jael and Lycos, like <laughs> you just go ahead, you enjoy that. Remember, Lycos has a grappling hook. It's garbage. Evnis, like we've known from page one of the first book that Evnis is a bad guy and he sells his soul to Azeroth, the devil character. Like, what is he doing? Like, read this book. He gets such a raw deal for having sold himself to the devil. Like, you think he'd get something else out of this. Like, that's just a note that I made. I'm like, Ethnis, you suck for having, like, made a bargain with, with, you know, essentially Satan. Shouldn't you be getting more out of this than you are? I don't even know. And so Valor continues, uh, continues the story of the, the Bright Star and the Black Sun. We learn more about the identity of both of them. We learn more about the forces that are really at play here, about the, more about the Ben Alim and the Kadashim, which is just like freaking good and bad angels. We learn more about the Vinthaloon and they have like fighting pits and which is very like most fantasy books, or especially guys, if you ever played RPGs, if you've played RPGs your entire life, there's always an arena level. Reading fantasy, there's uh, there's very often arena levels. Like, I mean, there's an arena level in this book as well, and it's fine. It's fine. I mean, I'm I'm a, a, a classics teacher, so, you know, gladiatorial combat, that's fine. But we learn more about the Vinthaloon there. Um, we learn more about the, the the kingdoms in the north, on the northwest, which uh, Philip Chase said is very, very Irish in both its naming and, you know, kind of the, uh, kind of the, the, the terrain. And what I like about this book is the same I liked about the first book, is John Gwynne's prose is just, it is a workhorse. Like, it is, it is so easy. Like, it's just, it's just simple and it doesn't bog you down with just like dense details. He tells you exactly what you need to know and then he moves on. Uh, because of this, we don't really know what everybody looks like very clearly. Um, it's a lot of dark haired people with beards and a couple redheaded people. But the plus side of this is that travel, like sometimes time passes in just a page, like months, weeks and months, days, weeks, months pass just in just a paragraph. Like traveling, we do not have to see every freaking leg of the travel journey compare with Martin and Feast of Crows and Dance for Dragons. Guys, do y'all realize that in Game of Thrones, Catelyn makes the trip from Winterfell to King's Landing in like in a chapter and yet we have to watch every leg of these Tyrion's bleeding journey in Dance with Dragons. Please get an editor, Mr. Martin. Please get, please get an editor. But anyway, John Gwynn, we have none of those problems. It moves from here to there, done. Like we do not have to see like what everybody eats and every time you use a bathroom. It's just like he gets us to where it needs to be. And yet the book is still long because there's so much happening that he just removes the boring parts. You too, Tolkien. I don't need a page about what the freaking leaves on the tree looks like. Move it, remove it excise the tumor, get rid of it, and get us to the next point, because that's what kind of book this is. You don't read it for the prose and the description and the terrain. You read it for the plot and the war. This is excellent military fiction. So much battles. Now, in addition to so much battles, there is so many betrayals. This book should be called Betrayal, because I can't really keep track of the turn coding. There is, like, you gotta turn your coat inside out and then turn it back and then turn it back and then turn it back and then turn it back. There are like, you know, double, triple, quadruple, quintuple agents. It, <laughs> there is so much betrayal. Like, you, you don't even know. Like, you think you know where it's going. And that's, that's the great thing about what Gwyn does. He takes these, these kind of archetypes and, and maybe, you know, kind of classic fantasy tropes and then he just does something different that you didn't expect. There's a lot of betrayal, be warned. But I do like that we do get more information about that earth magic, that giant magic, the uh, the magic system in this world that we got barely anything of in the first book. So 
we do get to see what it entails, kind of more of what its its power is, and kind of comparing it to like the power of the Ben Alim and the Kadashim, which seems to be completely different, like the power of, the, of those seven artifacts or whatever, like the cauldron and the, and the starstone axe and things. So all of this just, it just builds to this just incredible gripping conclusion that just is just incredibly climactic and ends and there's a scene where someone's just sitting on the steps kind of taking everything in and just wondering what the heck's going on. And it's, oh, it's just really powerful in that quiet moment as the, as, uh, the book wraps up. And it's just, it's, just, it's just good, and I cannot wait to read Ruin. And now this book is called Valor, and for good reason. Because this book has a lot to say about honor and valor. It asks, it, it, it asks what is honorable? Like, what does that mean to have honor? Is it, is it keeping oaths? Is it staying alive to, uh, to, to keep that oath, to keep a promise, to accomplish a goal? Does the end justify the means? Is it honorable if you are doing the right thing, like going toward a goal that is for justice and for right, is it still honorable if you have to do in incredibly just disdainful and abhorrent things to get there? The I love it when I love in justifying the means like questions and ponderings. Uh, it also it also shines a light on does every man, even honorable and righteous and and courageous men, do. Does all mankind have some of the dark side lurking inside them? And so, ah, uh, this book is just right up my alley. Very, very big and and bombastic and 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 between good and evil and talking about virtue and honor, truth and courage, man. Though they do not say that in this book, they said it more. They said it in the first book, and I I think they say it all over the place in the next one. So I've heard, but they do not say it in this book. So guys, on the Kingfin approval system, I give Valor the same as I gave Malice a superb minus. It is excellent. Uh, it's excellent. I'm leaving room for the other ones if they're if I like them even better. On the stars, it's five stars. It's five stars, just like Malice was. It's an easy five stars. So readable, so enjoyable, so action packed. I do understand some people's complaints about Malice, about the series, where they uh, uh, for the things they don't like about it. I do get that, but it's just a matter of. Are you someone who likes that kind of stuff? Like, there are just things that I can overlook. Just like really dense, like philosophical, like navel gazing. That's not necessarily a negative for a book if that's something that you like. It's not something that I like, so I tend to think that it's, it's negative if people stare at their belly buttons and nothing happens for hundreds of pages. But, and, and the prose is super dense. This is none of that. It is move, 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 go, 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 go. It's like, the, it's like a getaway car equivalent of a fantasy novel. So guys, that is all that I have for you today. As always, information about my Discord and my Patreon are down in the description. And I will be back next month to talk about ruin and make sure you check out Abby's channel next month as well for our group discussion. I'll see you guys next time. Truth and courage!